We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I have five Mabel clients at present and I work 16 hours a week. I have been using Mabel for over four and a half years now. It's really awesome because I have the opportunity to engage with clients who need support. They can put out their posts and I can read through a little bit about the needs that they have and see if I feel like that matches up to my skills. Mabel have actually helped me so much and now I have built my career. I was able to find all the information that I needed on the website. There was always somebody on the other end of the telephone to talk me through any questions that I had. There's lots of training and advice all on the website, so it made my transition into the program very easy. Mabel is honestly one of the most user-friendly platforms I have experienced. I would recommend Mabel because I have had nothing but positive experiences with it. You decide how hard you want to work, when you want to work, who you want to work for and where you want to work. I would definitely recommend the Mabel platform. In fact, I already have two other carers. I love every minute of it. Welcome to the Mabel Independent Support Workers Summit. Please welcome to the stage, Emma Clark, Mabel's Chief Financial Officer. Hi everyone and welcome to our Independent Support Workers Conference. Um, I first of all want to thank, on behalf of the team at Mabel, everybody here in the room. For those of you online, we're here in Melbourne and it is dreary and it is grey and it is cold and it keeps raining on us and if any of the people in the room were like me this morning, your alarm went off and you went, oh, maybe just another half an hour in bed might be nice. Um, so to actually get up in that kind of weather come here, we really, really appreciate you taking the time and particularly on a Saturday. We're also joined by a pretty large online audience. They were all the people who did look at the alarm and go, nah, I'm just, I'm just going to do it from home. Um, but welcome to all of you too. Now, we have a really packed agenda for you, and this is your opportunity to get the inspiration you need to be an independent support worker on Mabel. On your lanyard today, now I don't have one, but on the back of your lanyard, you'll have a QR code, and you can scan that code obviously with your phone, and if you haven't signed up, it'll take you to the sign up page. If you've signed up, but you're partway through the onboarding process, it'll take you to where you are on that and prompt you to continue. And if you're already onboarded, it will take you to the search jobs function. Each session today is designed to give you the information that you need to establish your small business in the care sector, and more importantly, work out how to set yourself up for success. Today, you're going to hear from a wide variety of people. You're going to hear from a panel of support workers. I'm going to interview them and get into the real detail and murky details of how this all actually works. We've got our Chief Product Officer, Jay, who's going to come and share with you the tips and tricks about how you can actually get the most out of the platform. We've got a small business finance expert. I'm going to go see him after the conference. Uh, David Rankin, who's going to share advice on financial wellness and what the accounting responsibilities that go with running your own small business actually entail. Then you're going to hear firsthand from some clients in the aged care and disability sectors about what they actually look for in support workers. We also have guest speakers from Dementia Australia and Autism from the Inside, who will share some insights on how you manage clients with dementia and autism. And lastly, we have had a change of speakers this afternoon with our conversation style discussion between Tim Dorner and Dylan Allcut. Unfortunately, Dylan can't make it today, but we actually have in his place our professional golfer and double amputee Mike Rolls, who will share some wonderful insights to how he lives his life. We're not going to trap you here for six hours with no breaks. There's wonderful breaks in between. Um, and at, at the end of each section, we've got a QA and uh, a section. So if anyone has any questions as they're listening to the speakers present, there will be ample opportunity to ask whatever question you would like to ask in that. Now, if you're like me, this is for the people in the room, 
and you go to the movies and screen dims and then someone phone goes off, I sit there and I think, who the hell did that, seriously? So make sure you have your phones turned off or on silent and there's, as I said, plenty of breaks for you to check messages and talk to people. Um, we've also got Nigel. Nigel, raise your hand for a second. Okay, Nigel's our roving, see that very professional photography piece of equipment? So he's gonna be taking some snapshots during the day. Some people love to get their face on camera. Some people absolutely hate it. If he wanders up to you and you don't wanna put your face on camera, just be like, right? And if you're happy, just keep doing what you're doing. Okay, first session for the day. Who doesn't love a great origin story? Like, Marvel and DC Comics have literally made hundreds of millions of dollars off doing these. Uh, we have our own origin story. Mabel is actually run by two founders, Peter and Tony. And so we took a short video with them so that they could explain why they set Mabel up and what they think is so special about this particular business. So without further ado, I'll queue up the video. Hi everyone, I'm Peter. And I'm Tony, and we're the co-founders of Mabel. And welcome everyone to our Support Worker Summit. Back in 2013, my dad was in his early 90s and, and becoming very frail. Mum was in her mid-80s with dementia. They were living at home in Wagga, which is where I was born. But they also had some home help and support through a traditional provider. Different people were being rostered to the house on a daily basis. So my dad would often say, I get a knock at the door in the morning and I've never seen this person before. And with dementia, you can become quite anxious. You can become quite fearful if you don't have familiarity and you don't know what's happening. For both of them, it was more or less this concept, we don't need these strangers in our life and they wanted to be left alone. They were gonna cope on their own. But we sort of realized that was gonna be challenging. And so it was really about, okay, how could we build a solution that would connect people like my parents with people in their community uh, that they could actually build a relationship with and build trust with. And luckily at that stage, you know, I knew Tony and we actually decided to sort of leverage a lot of that background uh, and his background in coming together to try and, you know, build Maple. I started my career as an investment banker. And before that, I guess I got my real education. I used to, I grew up with a family of builders. So I, um, actually spent most of my holidays uh, working on a building site. I remember Client Zero uh, very vividly. A client uh, who was looking after her elderly mum, uh, she had early stages of dementia, uh, was at the end of her tether and uh, she called up and we took her through the platform. She managed to find someone that she connected with. Literally that was all done within the first 24 hours. That original worker that she got, that was a two or three year relationship. You know, right from the bat, we got really positive feedback about the value that Mabel could provide. It was an exciting time, but also a stressful one. But I feel like most of the DNA of Mabel was formed in that first year in terms of its culture and its mission and its product and the value that it was delivering both the clients and workers. But pretty quickly through doing Mabel, we got quite close to a lot of people with disability and so it was through the generosity of all the people that came to Mabel and sharing their stories with us which helped us understand you know how the Mabel platform could make a difference to people with disability as well. The social impact for me resonated because uh, in my earlier career days you know I got exposed to a lot of founders that were solving some pretty complicated problems and if you're going to put so much effort into something and it's going to be such a part of your work life do you want it to have something that's a bit broader than yourself and has some sort of long longevity to its impact. You don't go past a day where you're not reading about the challenges with the NDIS, the challenges in home care, the challenges with budget, workforce, rural and remote communities. And I actually think we're part of the solution. I'm really excited about where we go from here and I think in some ways we're just getting started trying to use technology and try and provide tools that make engaging on Mabel simpler, easier and more fulfilling. For a support worker thinking about joining Mabel, I think we want to unlock the opportunity for you to really run a business that you're proud of. I think the benefits that you get on Mabel is that the level of remuneration that you can that you can get as well as the ability to choose who you work with. For people that are looking to do a few hours in their community and try and provide a positive impact, we can cater for that. For someone that wants to make a career out of it and feels like um, 
you know, that they have a calling to help people in their community, we can also cater for that. I think we want to unlock all of that potential people have so that they can shape the future of aged care and disability support. If you care, you're halfway there. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I will definitely say as a person who works uh, at Mabel that it is truly marvellous to work for such a purpose-driven organisation. There's actually um, not that many around and so it's a fantastic experience. Okay, in terms of the next session, I'd like to invite our three independent support worker panellists up to the stage for a Q&A session. If you'd like to come up, I'll quickly intro them as they come up. So we have David Mould. He's been on Mabel for more than five and a half years. David provides social support and domestic assistance to older people. And when he isn't working with clients, you can find him rescuing animals. And I had a wonderful conversation with you about that outside. Fascinating. Uh, so if you're an animal lover, you're going to get along exceptionally well with David. Then we have Gwen Smith. She's been a support worker on Mabel for just over two years. Gwen has a background in psychology and counselling, and this provides her with the knowledge she needs to understand neurodevelopmental ooh, disorders and brain injuries and diseases. And Gwen works with people with various disabilities, including children with autism, MS and Parkinson's. Um, she thoroughly enjoys enabling people to connect with their community, building their social skills and assisting with people's domestic needs. And then last but not least, we have Ruby Hitchman. She's been a support worker on Mabel for more than two years. And Ruby mainly works with clients who have a disability offering social support and domestic assistance. She enjoys working with clients who are in their late teens or early 20s to support them in doing all the activities that people of their age enjoy, such as socialising and shopping. I would do the same thing, just if I, 100%. Okay, so I'm just going to start some Q&A. We're going to Go beyond like the top level. There's like lots of knowledge articles on Mabel that you can read that tell you about you know the various facets of being an independent support worker. But it's not often that we actually get three people who can talk through their lived experience of it. So, without any further preamble from me, um, I might actually start with you, Gwen. How did you end up deciding to become an independent support worker? How did you find your way to us? Um, I started off. Uh with COVID. Um, I was a chef for 20 years and I was um, going to change my career. So I did a, started studying psychology. Um, I had no idea where to start. So it, um, the Mabel app got suggested to me by a friend who's already doing it. And um, the rest is history. I uh, um, really embraced the app and um, it helped me set up a business. I started off with just thinking it's a part-time thing. I'm just going to do a couple of shifts. It's just to see if I can work with people and if I really enjoy it. I've, um, and um, as mentioned, the knowledge that I've um, picked up with the psychology, together with my chefing skills, just um, slotted in. It just happened. So um, I found Mabel very helpful in giving me structure um, and just that get your foot in the door. Um, so yeah, it's just helped me embrace the skills that I already have and just, um, yeah, do it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Gwen. Ruby, your story as to how you came to be with us is super interesting and exciting. Do you want to give people the highlights of it? Yeah, of course. So when I started doing support work, I was working doing domestic cleaning as a bit of a maid. Um, and a lot of my clients through that were through the NDIS. So I'd already worked with a wide range of disabilities. I had a few clients who had said to me, I think you'd be great doing support work. Would you be keen to take on some extra shifts? And I'd never really thought of myself doing a role like that. Uh, I was 19 at the time and I'd never really considered disability work as an option. Uh, I ended up taking someone up on their offer and slowly transitioned out of cleaning because really who wants to be doing cleaning 24-7? It's very hard work. Um, and now I work full time as a support worker. Wonderful. Thanks for that, Ruby. And David, finally to you, you have been on the platform for the longest. Um, I would imagine it looked a bit different when you found it five and a half years ago, but what was, what was your starting point? Um, I didn't know anything about it at first, but I had a friend who I've known since I was about 11 or 12. His condition has been degenerative and, and been getting steadily worse. 
And we weren't really able to catch up much, but he was like, hey, I'm on this platform, you could be a carer for me. And I started looking into it that way. Side note, not a good idea. Friendship and care work mixing just mm -hmm. changed everything. He um, very much became now the, the demanding friend and that boundary was a problematic one, so we stopped doing that. Um, so yeah, that, that was how I started. Just, he got me into it. And, and so actually that, that leads to an interesting place because there is a special relationship between the support worker and the clients, which is sometimes can blur a little bit on, on friend, but you have to have some kind of boundaries. I mean, obviously you've learned a fair bit both through that original experience and then since then. Is there anything you'd like to like just make sure that everyone understands or, or, or about that sort of dynamic? Well, my experience is that care workers suck at setting boundaries. We are um, the kind of people who just want to say yes to every request that's made of us, and this is deeply unhealthy, and we walk away feeling terrible about it and never reinforcing that boundary. And once we've started doing that, it's really hard to stop. So setting boundaries early on in a relationship is critical. Um, defining what the work relationship actually is and then reminding yourself constantly that it is a work relationship because while you're with a person they are wonderful and friendly and you do everything you can to make them feel liked and supported and that is the elements of friendship right there and then you walk away having done too much or overstepped a line just a little bit and feeling I feel weird now about this, but I don't know how to fix it. So, yeah, setting those, those terms early on and then reinforcing them throughout has been my key learning and probably the hardest one. And how do you actually do that in a practical sense? Yeah. So I begin with um, making that first contact and having that conversation to see if you're compatible, to see if they're even interested in engaging you, but also to use that time to probe what it is that they want the role to be and then setting that as the, as the definitions of the work and saying, great, I'm really keen on doing that. I'm not keen on going much beyond that, that line. Once we've established that, let me make it clear that, that that's the role that I'll be doing. So that you don't find yourself rocking up saying, so I agreed to do the shopping. Um, I didn't agree to then come and clean out the fridge as well or you know, whatever else happens to be on their mind at the time, which is really hard because each little task is just a small step beyond, it's not really that difficult and you're there anyway and why not, it helps. But you've got to set that line and then say, sorry, that's, that's where our agreement uh, ends because these are the roles that I've agreed to do. Uh, if you'd like to revisit the, the agreement, we can look at that, but yeah, I tend to like to set the agreement out first and then only do that. Mm. So it sounds like you're providing quite a lot of clarity in the in the working relationship, which is super yeah, now. helpful. Not not the beginning, but now. <laughs> You've learnt. Yeah, yeah. And Gwen, what kind of clients are you working with at the moment? Feel free to tell us a little bit about them, obviously without divulging anything that we shouldn't. Um, I ended up uh, working with someone with multiple sclerosis. Um, she's in a wheelchair with very, very limited... Um, ability to move um, her arms or can move her arms a little bit um, and we found a common interest in cooking she used to love to cook um, so I work a lot with her um, it takes a lot of patience she's got very labor talking um, I think um, just yeah her thinking and um, the way she processes stuff is really slow, so it taught me to really slow down. Um, and it can be quite challenging with patience. You need to be extremely patient. Um, you can't just go ahead and cook. Um, you need to take her in consideration. So we do a lot of that together, and it's got a lot. My job has also um, expanded a little bit. Like David was telling, um, the original agreement was just to take her out for social outings. Um, but I did revisit the agreement. Um, we had ended up just taking her out a little bit. I realized she gets quite uncomfortable, um, physically uncomfortable. She's got a lot of pain. So she often just wants to stay in. And then we just cook. And um, yeah, it's the job grew into something completely different. So what you initially think the job would be like, um, can change quite a bit. So 
I totally agree with David. You need an agreement in place, and I've got a certain term on it, on when it gets reviewed. And um, w with having the agreement in place, I could go back to the client and says, we've got this agreement. You are asking me now a little bit more, um, and then, yeah, adjusting it. Um, I've got clients with intellectual disabilities. Um, the challenges there are very different. Um, I find families uh, under a lot of stress mm -hmm. a lot of times. I find the clients actually really easy to work with um, and the families being the challenge. I find they are under a lot of emotional stress and um, got sometimes quite high expectations. Um, and managing that as well, because that's not something you can put in an agreement. That is something you need to negotiate with um, the families. And that's personal boundaries that's going under radar. Um, and I found with a lot of clients, that's boundaries that was really hard to set. Um, because it's stuff that you can't just say out loud. I think you, as a support worker, absorb quite a lot of stuff. Um, so it's just like unwritten rules and um, invisible boundaries that you just put in place. I kind of just need to cut off my um, own emotions and stuff sometimes and just put boundaries in place. So that's with the intellectual disabilities. Um, there's a safety thing involved with, as well with um, intellectual disability. They um, sometimes lash out, they sometimes um, uh, become really frustrated. So. It's, I, th I found that quite challenging to um, get to know them, win their trust. Um, I, I learned not to just jump in and start doing stuff with someone um, and to keep your boundaries that way. It's just to build trust first. You've got the family pushing from the one end and mm -hmm. then you've got um, the clients pushing, pulling back. Um, so yeah, that is something to keep in mind. Um, and then the other... My last client is children. Children takes a lot of energy. I think mm. um, I don't think that's my um, strongest uh, asset. A um, lot of running around, ADHD. Um, yeah, a lot of energy. They take a lot of energy from you. So yeah, it's it's finding your own niche. Um, I ended up cooking for the family more than um, just running after the kids, um, but. I think that's where my chefing skills came in, is um, multitasking mm. with kids. So I think, um, you know, in listening to Gwen speak, you actually learn a lot about yourself as you become an independent support worker and you work out what are the things that you engage in and really enjoy doing. And, you know, unsurprisingly, as you learn that, I think some of the best matches are made when your interests coincide with the client's interests and you get to both do the things that you enjoy together. And I know, Ruby, that you in particular make sure that there's a really great match between you know, what your clients actually want to spend their time doing and what you enjoy spending your time doing. Can you maybe run the audience a little bit through, like, what does a shift actually look like? Like, what, what interests do you share with your clients and how does that actually work in practice? Yeah, so I tend to work shifts that are anywhere between two to maybe six hours. So a standard day for me might be going to my first client's house, getting them up, getting them ready, making sure that they're dressed for the day, packing lunches, and getting them to whatever day program or activity or plans that they have planned for the day. Uh, I then might have a half an hour, hour break. I might go do grocery shopping with someone. I might pick someone up from somewhere and transport them to an appointment. Um, but in the afternoons, I generally do a lot of skill building and fun stuff with my clients. Uh, I also do a lot of cooking with my clients and encourage them that that's like a life skill that they'd want to build on. Uh, I take them out shopping. I take them to... <laughs> Uh, the movies or whatever activities that they'd like to be doing and I encourage them to hang out with their peers and get a lot of stuff done socially. It's just really empowering for me as a worker to know that I'm impacting the way that somebody is now able to live their life. Hmm. And look, I think, you know, as our speakers have talked through their experiences, there's definitely some challenges, boundary setting, working with vulnerable people, working with people with different sets of needs, but you wouldn't be doing it if you didn't enjoy it. So I just want you, and David, I'll start with you, what is the single most joyful thing about the work that you do? Um, 
Well, I have one client that uh, has really struggled to exercise. Uh, her condition has her in a wheelchair, and the one exercise she can do is swimming. Um, but the pool has been very unfriendly, and so she's required some support to access the place, which means that I end up sort of sitting next to the pool and reading a book for, for an hour, so that's great, um, just to make sure that she gets the lane to herself. Um, and she's had a few nasty incidents in the past where people have not been very accommodating to her. Um, but providing her that safety and security while I'm doing so very little, the rewarding bit came some six months after when I saw her. She was zooming along in her wheelchair at one point, slammed on the brakes, leapt from the chair and carried on walking to the bed. And I just thought that wasn't possible. I'm still not quite sure how she did it, but like to, to see that kind of achievement arc, that, that, was pretty, that was pretty striking. And I thought I, I managed to make that happen just by creating access to a space that she felt she couldn't go to otherwise. Mm. So that, I mean, that, that was a real light bulb moment there of this matters. Mm. It's gonna stick in your head forever now, isn't it? Yeah. Gwen, how about you? Um, yeah, definitely a lot of benefit from it. I will not be doing it if it wasn't um, rewarding. Um, and I think I've explained before um, the challenges and it's overcoming those challenges and um, seeing the families appreciating you, like going back and talking about um, rights and stuff and they realise they actually do appreciate you and they want to keep you on. Um, especially with challenging clients, um, when you do win their trust and um, with a lot of patience and a lot of, like you put so much energy into it. So if you um, realize that someone actually do trust you, um, yeah, it's just, that's the rewarding bit for me, is mm -hmm. um, yeah, putting your boundaries in place, but also um, successfully balancing it all so that you can win the person's trust through it and continue, like if they continue using you, you just go, yes, I'm doing something right. Get that feel good factor. And how about yourself, Ruby? I think similar to David's answer, watching my clients achieve their goals is super rewarding for me. Um, I've got a client who I take rollerblading every Friday and when we first started, she would cling to the barrier and she couldn't move, but she was so determined to get it and we've been going every week for about three months now. Uh, I think last week when we went, I timed her and she rode around the rink, no barriers, nothing. She made it around in a minute flat, which was really amazing to see. Um, I'm always there. I like to think of my as my client's number one cheerleader in situations like that. I'm always very proud sending photos to the family members and like posting shift notes and stuff like that. But yeah, it's really incredible to see. Wonderful, thank you so much. Gwen, I suspect in our audience here today and in our audience online, we have quite a lot of people who are either not yet being a support worker, considering it as a, as a career change for themselves, or very, very early in their journey. So I'm just wondering, like, what are your tips and tricks for someone who's just starting out on the Mabel platform? Um, I think it's the first thing is to realise that you're a sole trader and not um, working for agencies, um, and that when you walk into the job, um, the person will expect you to... Um, yeah, present yourself as someone, as a sole trader of business and set the boundaries, um, have your agreement ready. Um, they'll ask you about rates and they will start negotiating rates or they will um, just assume that you know a lot. So it's, um, I think, getting support from your peers, from people that's also carers and also on the Mabel platform is um, priceless. Um, at the start, I was lucky enough to um, have met another carer who was at the same stage as me, also post-COVID, um, starting up a business, and uh, lucky enough, we clicked really well, and that was absolutely priceless, as just bouncing off each other ideas, Mabel, calling Mabel, asking them for advice on certain things, so that will be key first thing, is to um, realize that, yes, um, putting everything in place, agreements, um, uh, rates, um, and getting the structure, which Mabel is very good for, in place. Great, and how about you, David? 
I'm thinking more what not to do. <laughs> that's all, that's always <laughs> that was my early helpful. experience, all yeah. the things not. I, I love the idea of, of not doing this alone, of finding other support workers. Mm. I was, I didn't know anyone else for a while. Um, now it gets to the point you can, you, you're down at the shopping centre or something and you start being able to spot a few people around and go, you're one of us. <laughs> and you just know. Um, but I would really love to have had this, this kind of connection with other people and, and just someone to offload with a little bit, um, not to necessarily talk about every detail of your client, just to, to not bring it home with you. That was one of the things that mm -hmm. I was doing, is finding that the, particularly if it was a negative energy client, I was coming home with all of that. So for a while I just I stopped the car um, at a park somewhere and I would take my own notes and do my own debrief. And it just never occurred to me to reach out for other workers. That would have been brilliant. So that sounds like probably the best advice that you could possibly have, don't do this alone. Mm, I would I would agree. And for those of you who are signing up going through the onboarding process, we do um, conduct uh, sessions like uh, they're virtual where you get to dial in and, and one of the Mabel people gives you tips and tricks, but you also get to meet other people also going through the same process as you at the same time. So it does afford a bit of an opportunity for you to meet other people who are at the same point and to both Gwen and David's point, potentially establish connections. And then also I think it's just about thinking about who in your own network do you know that you could form that sort of community and, and connection with and be able to feel supported in, in what you're doing. And then Ruby, how about yourself? What tips and tricks do you have? I think definitely utilising all of Mabel's resources that they have on the platform. Um, I know when I started, I was clueless. I'd never even considered going into support work, so I really had no idea what was expected of me or what sort of work I could do or even what I was qualified to do. And so looking through all of the frequently asked questions and Mabel's resources really helped me sort of distinguish what I was able to offer as a support worker and how to go about supporting people. Great, and I'm actually gonna stay with you, Ruby, for the next one because, and I have to preface this, this next lot of questions with, I'm not giving financial advice. None of my lovely panelists are giving financial advice. But when you think about it, this concept of I am my own business can be somewhat daunting for people. Like, what does that even mean? What do I need to do? I'm you know, maybe just used to turning up to a job and working my shift and, and leaving, and then there's a paycheck at some point. Um, and obviously, being an independent support worker is, is quite different from that. And so I want to get a little bit into what learnings you have from setting up your own business. Uh, I suspect here there's a lot of things around maybe what you would do differently if you started again from scratch with a bit more knowledge. Um, and also, we'll talk through that first, but then we will get into, and you guys have already mentioned it a few times, like how do you set hourly rates? Like what's the expectation? How, do you, how should you think about that when you're setting them? But let's, let's start with the whole very scary small business concept. So Ruby, you obviously went from doing the domestic cleaning at 19 to setting up your own business. What have you learned from that? So the first year I did support work, my taxes were in shambles. I pushed them into a corner and said, I'm not going to focus on that. That's too much to think about right now. Um, I did not do any work with my finances. I just took my money in and went, yep, that's good. Um, a year into doing support work, I realised that that's not a sustainable way to go about things and the ATO is probably going to chase me up on this at some point. So I ended up going and finding a really good accountant that specialised in working with sole traders and small businesses. And I sat down with him and I said, look, it's a disaster. I need help. Please help. And he was lovely and so non-judgmental. And from there, I've gotten a lot of education. I've also used, like I said, Mabel's resources um, to learn about how to manage my tax and super. But before that, I was hopeless. I was 19. I knew nothing about money. And I think I've really taken it as a great learning experience to kind of say, hey, I haven't done this right. It's time to take a step back, think about it, and go from there. And aside from the tax first year surprises, how difficult did you actually find it from a paperwork perspective to set up your own business and understand like what your obligations were under that kind of structure? So I was lucky enough to already have an ABN set up from when I was doing cleaning work. So I just used the same ABN and continued um, into doing support work. But I think managing like the fact that you obviously are self-driven and have to find your own clients and set up your own hours and sort of choose who you want to be working with. 
I was really lucky in the sense that because I was doing casual cleaning work, I did a slow transition. So I kept some of my cleaning jobs and started doing some support work shifts a week. And then once I was more comfortable, I said bye to my cleaning job and just picked up a few more clients as I've gone along. I think at the moment I have anywhere between five and seven clients that I see on a weekly basis. Um, I do prefer to keep that number quite small, just so that way I'm getting a more personal relationship with my clients and I'm not trying to juggle too much for myself. But I think, yeah, definitely taking into account what I can handle within my own scope of practice is very important. I've had clients in the past where I've started working with them, realised that I'm in a bit too deep and I'm a bit over my head and I'm not very comfortable working with them and had to take a step back and say, look, I'm really sorry, but I don't think I'm the best fit for you as a support worker. Hey, thank you. Very, very useful tips there, Ruby. David, and I understand from talking to you outside that the uh, proceeds from your small business generally get harvested back into your annual animal rescue uh, activities, and so I'm sure they're all very grateful for that. Um, what tips and tricks do you have around the running your own business? We should really just set up the payment account details <laughs> to be my vet and just have him take it all. Um, I think Ruby's hit on some, some really great ones there. There's a temptation, I think, to, to race into this and do the hustle of grab every client that, that's out there. Yes, I can do that, I can do that. Um, and you'll be doing everything from washing windows to mowing the lawn to taking people shopping to helping someone with showering. I, I think it's really important to understand what your business mode will be. Uh, and Ruby's set up one that seems perfect, and I, I wish I'd done that early on rather than sort of snatching at everything that I thought, oh, I could do that, that'll, that'll put some money in the account. Um, it would have been more sustainable for me emotionally. Um, I think so that would be one key thing there. Um, I'm not sure I'm really answering the question at all. I no, just no, no, that's fine, because actually sort of you're <laughs> answering a question we haven't asked, but it's a really good question, which is, you know, obviously the amount of clients that you should take and the type of activities that you should engage in depends very much on your own personal circumstances and how many hours a week you want to put into this particular part of your life. Um, but it sounds like you've all effectively, in your own mind, formed a view on what that sort of ideal ratio is for you. So that's sort of where you're going, um, David, with that. So, you know, is there... How many clients at the moment, like, what do you think is, like, a, a good ratio? Well, I'm on three regular clients and one that's sporadic. Um, and I think that's probably my maximum. Um, yeah, I really do think that there is a, a realm for keeping this tidy and compact with, with the number of clients that you take on and really develop that working relationship whilst always being ready to say, this isn't working anymore. And partly, I, I, I did this for one myself where I realised this relationship is starting to seem like it's become codependent in some way. I'm not being a care worker anymore, I'm being pushed into a parenting role. Um, so for the sake of the client, as well as for myself, I had to, to come to this realisation of, I'm not the best fit for you anymore. Uh, and so we had to have a, a very difficult conversation. But that was, yeah, and I probably left that longer than it really should have gone, but that's, that's a really important um, part of the identity of the work that you're taking on, of knowing where those lines are and where that limit is and being ready to say, I need to stop this client and start with, with someone else, um, not just for your own sake, but for the sake of the client as well. And in your experience, having been on um, for so long, how long do you, do you on average work with clients for? Because obviously you're forming that really deep and meaningful connection. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's two clients that I've had for the majority of that time. Um, and the others would have gone something, you know, six to eight months um, before either it wasn't working out or they transitioned into needing something else. And it wasn't about that the relationship wasn't working. It was that they were improving on a lot of things in their life and they needed something else that I wasn't able to give. So, um, but then other, other clients have been really just clean the windows. It's a one-off. Um, or once a month I go and mow the lawns or something like that. Um, yeah, so that I'm, I'm getting like a bit mix. past those kind of jobs, though, to be honest. So someone else can have them. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Someone in the audience, perhaps. And Gwen, how about yourself? You obviously found all this through COVID, setting up... I don't know if you already had your own business or you had to set one up during COVID, but do you have any experiences through that that you'd like to share? I had an ABN because I used to cater a little bit um, for retirement villages, so... Um, yeah, I had an ABN, but I, I was thinking while listening to David and Ruby, uh, for me, in, in the beginning, it was 
um, taking on whatever work comes along. So I realized I don't like running after kids. That was a definite, um, even though I still have a client. Um, and it was the hours. So I also realized I committed to after eight or after six o'clock in the evenings and realized, no, I do need to switch off after six o'clock. Um, the evening shifts just didn't gel. Um, and then I've got this thing where I feel clients, there's golden hours in the middle of the day where everybody wants you is between 11 and three. Um, and I find it challenging because they only want you for five hours or for three hours. And I have the saying that I tell them that's the golden hours. So if you want my golden hours, you need to, I can't just commit to that because you can't get someone before that or after that and I don't work after six. So it was negotiating um, what I feel comfortable with personally. Like I need um, my off time in the evening or I am not an early bird. So if you're gonna commit to a six o'clock start, it's not sustainable for me. Um, so yeah, it was those boundaries about hours. That was really important. Um, yeah, and that's, yeah. And I also got an accountant, just got an accountant because I was pretty good with good keep bookkeeping, but um, it's a bit more about, it's expanding. I thought it was going to be a part-time gig and it's turning into my um, entire income. So yeah, I was with Ruby there, definitely a good accountant. I have a feeling both of you are going to get mobbed at the end of this session saying, share your accountant details with us. Um, so, <laughs> so you might want to make a quick exit out the back. Um, so in terms of, um, actually, let's talk about hourly rates before I switch topics altogether. How do you find, I mean, a couple of you have already mentioned, you know, you walk in, people are expecting you to represent yourself as a business. If there is that uh, connection and that match, you know, then they're wanting to talk to you about hourly rates. Like, that can be a somewhat sensitive topic at times. How do you navigate through that, Ruby? So, I know when I started, Mabel's indicative rate was, I think, still at $32 an hour. I know it's definitely changed since I've started on the platform. Um, because I was an entry-level worker, I had no qualifications that were particularly relevant to the sector. I did have a certificate in hospitality from my time working in kitchens, and I had my RSA and stuff, but that's not super relevant. I set my starting hourly rate at $35 an hour. I've had clients since then who after say three to six months of working with them have said, okay, I think it's time for you to put your rates up or I think it's time for you to add a weekend rate if you want some weekend work. Um, and for me, it's always about looking at the NDIS price caps and taking that into account along with Mabel's suggested hourly rates and just whatever else everyone else is doing on the platform, as well as my own experience level and qualification. Yeah, and I think it's important to say um, Mabel won't tell you what rates to set. What we do provide is a handy table that we update every quarter that says, here's what the average rates being charged in agreements on the platform for the last six months have been, and it will give a, a weekday rate, a Saturday rate, Sunday public holiday rate, just as helpful guidance. But obviously within that, and, and this is to your point, Ruby, you do need to take into consideration what your level of skill and experience is because when someone posts a job, they're likely to be meeting more than one person, particularly to find out if that match is there. And so they will be meeting people with different sets of skills and experience in terms of what they're after and so that will also play a bit of a part because it is ultimately at the end of the day a negotiation at an individual level. Um, David, do you have anything to add to Ruby's points on hourly rates? Uh, well, some clients will negotiate hardball. They're really good at it and uh, you'll even feel that sort of, oh, we've already made a connection, um, you know, maybe maybe I could, I could do a little bit less this time and, and it starts to slide. And I find it impossible to raise the rates after that, that conversation's too hard for me and I'm highly conflict avoidant. Uh, so I, I, I've taken a mindset now of I set my rates in advance and that's just a business decision um, and that, that's what it is. So there, there is no further negotiation beyond that and that will mean that some clients I'm not suitable for. And there you have it. That's, that's the end of that one. Because um, I do feel that there's a tendency for people to then undervalue themselves uh, and, and go with, especially if, you, if your client starts talking about, oh, this is what my package has, this is all I've got. It's none of our business what their package is. And as soon as they start telling me, I, I find myself getting really uncomfortable. I don't feel I should know those kind of details. 
these are my rates, use me as you, will, as you can, as you need to, uh, and that's where that should end. Um, but you also have to factor in that there's not the, not the enormous security in this, that, that the client could end the relationship and then you could be out for a couple of weeks before you get your next client. Um, so there needs to be some factoring in of, well, that's going to have to carry that over. You've got to think about paying yourself some superannuation. Do that. That's really important. Really. Um, and anything else that, that comes out of that as expenses, like the, those things all need to be factored in there and that this job can be erratic and irregular and your client then goes away for two weeks and you're not being paid. Um, that's the nature of gig work. So the rates should be set accordingly and not thought of in comparison to um, a, a nine to five job. Mm. Sorry, David, could I just chip in? I had something to add. I find for myself personally that a great way to go about talking about money and rates and everything like that, even if it, you are just setting a starting rate, I always make sure to put in the agreement that rates will be revisited after a set period, mm -hmm. like three months. I also make sure to protect myself in saying that if I was to give notice or my client was to give notice to end the agreement completely, two weeks notice is required and just things like that to protect myself. I know I have a two hour minimum that I work as well. So even if somebody just needs me for half an hour, I do have two hours in place that I will charge just because I obviously can't be running around doing 10 minute shifts and half an hour shifts all over the place. But yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of ways to go about protecting yourself and discussing money with the clients because at the end of the day, yeah, it is their money that you're using. None of that stuff is in my agreements at all and I feel like a complete idiot <laughs> listening to Ruby. Now, if someone's been taking notes of what she said, I want a copy at the Can end. Can I just say, David, half the audience is taking notes. I'm watching them all scribble all this down, right? So you'll have plenty of people to be able to get those off. Uh, Gwen, is there anything you would love to add to this vibrant debate on how to set rates? Yeah. Um, I agree with David on everything you said about being strict about your rates, but it was a journey to get there. Um, I started off also very low, um, and I found clients on that low rate, um, and it was quite awkward to go back and negotiate. I think that train has passed. If you've set a low rate with someone, um, to go back and say, oh, I made a mistake as a soldier, I think is a bit unprofessional. So. Um, I quickly learned um, what my worth is, um, going on the average rate of what everybody asks. And um, it's a how desperate you are for work as well. Like if you can just get your foot in the door, you go a little bit lower. And if you see, oh my, like this client is expecting quite a lot of me and I'm, I'm worth more. Um, I also have my agreement that I can revisit and go, hang on a minute. Um, we started off with these things. and. So that's how the negotiation worked. But once, after two years of knowing what my worth is, knowing what the average rate is, and going, this is my rates, it's not negotiable. I've had people that want to negotiate, and I've said straight up, it's not negotiable. This is my rates, and this is my business, um, and I'm not wavering. Um, but that's, it took a while. It's a, it was a journey for me. Yeah, I mean, you have to, as you are all saying, you have to become informed about how often you want to work, what type of shift hours you want to work, are you a morning or an evening person, do you want to work on weekends, and then what are the things that you need to build into your hourly rate around superannuation, do you want to take a holiday at some point, you know, what are the expenses to get to and from your clients, and then what do other people charge for the similar kind of services, and it's really the combination of all of those things, plus the skills and experience that you bring to that particular role that, that goes into that. So it's not surprising that most people, day one, don't have all the answers to that and gradually sort of find their, find their way there. Now, David, you talked about, you know, sometimes the agreements will end either because in wonderful situations the client has progressed so well that, that they need different things or because over time the match um, becomes not so much of a match. When you're looking for new clients, you come onto Mabel, you're looking for new clients, like what are you looking for? Well, when I'm scrolling the ads and the list, the job listings, I'm I'm looking for something that's close enough to home. Actually, no, I don't that's want, actually very important. For most I don't people. want to be driving yeah. too far anymore. Um, so yeah, looking for something within the region, and I'm looking for something that doesn't look like it's going to be one of those job creep kind of things. So when I see a listing that's got clear outlines of what the task is, I'm more attracted to that, and I try to reciprocate with my comments online and, and my profile online, not being an essay, because nobody wants to read that, uh, but being clear as well, detailed, not just a, hey, I'm a fun guy and I like doing stuff. 
pick me. You know, there's got to be a bit more into it than that. But I like the same from, from client listings. So if I see something that, like, um, you know, help a person get into the society a bit more, I'm like, I, I don't know what that means. That's it's not clear enough. I'm, I'm probably going to scroll past that one. Yeah. And so, Ruby, I know a lot of your clients have come about organically as you've sort of spread your wings, but if you were going and looking for new client relationships, what would you be looking for? I think a really big point for me is to find clients that are like actually willing to have a conversation through the Mabel platform even before a meet and greet. If I reach out to someone or they reach out to me and say they just send me a job privately and that's it, they just send me the job privately and don't say anything and I say like, hi, like I'd be love, I'd love to meet you, I'd be very interested in the role, like could you tell me a bit more about yourself and they don't reply with much or give me a one word answer. I think that's a pretty big red flag for me. I know I want to get along well with who I'm working with and I think that that definitely needs to go both ways, especially if I'm talking to, say, the family member or support coordinator of one of my clients. I definitely try and get a bit more insight about them and offer to meet up or do a meet and greet video chat. Um, before taking on any new clients. I know recently, actually, in the past couple of weeks, I've gone to interview for a new job position just because I had some availability, and as soon as I got to the spot to meet the client, the job was completely different to the one listed, and I kind of had to say, hello, sorry, this is not for me, it's not within my scope of practice, I don't feel comfortable, I don't think that it's going to work out. So I think, yeah, just really taking your time, looking for as David said, very detailed job ads, people will put up what they want. And if they're not willing to go to that effort, they're probably not going to be very good at facilitating a relationship. I've just taken a mental note that uh, if we do a client uh, conference, detail in your job ads is going to be something that we'll hit them up with, yeah? Um, and Gwen, how about yourself? How have you found uh, the selection of clients? Um, I still have my original clients, so I don't mm. often look for clients. Um, but I have had clients where um, I arrive and it's just not, yeah, not for me or vice versa. Um, but for me, it's definitely, David reminded me, driving, I don't drive a lot. It's just, yeah, that's a definite no. So I've had clients where the traffic on a Friday afternoon, for instance, is just not where I had to, um, yeah, after the second shift, just say it's not going to work. I can't sit in traffic for an hour. Um, so for me, it's more about, like I previously said, that golden hours and the traveling, um, making it convenient for me and not out in the evenings. Um, and I find it's impossible from a little writing or from messaging to really uh, know what, I'm, what the client is about. So the meet and greet is priceless there. I just, yeah, getting face to face. So I leave them the benefit of the doubt um, to them, and then in the meet and greet, I make my decision. Mm. So it very much sounds like talking to all three of you that having a really good understanding of yourself, first and foremost, but then how the importance of those meet and greets and really walking into those with a clear thought that if this isn't the match for me, if something feels off or the job's changed or I meet this person and I just don't feel like the connection's there, that you're comfortable enough within yourself in a really nice, polite, professional way to actually stop at that point and say, no, no, I, I don't think this is going to work. And not, you know, because you've gone to the meet and greet, feel that you um, have to somehow keep keep going further with that if it's not working. So I think that's a really important thing to draw out. The flip side of that might be important as well, that if you go and meet with a client and then they don't call you back and it, our rejection sensitivity gets triggered at that point, we're like, mm. what's wrong with me? It, nothing. They're, they're either found someone else, it wasn't working, they've changed their mind about needing that particular type of care and they don't want to have the conversation with you. We have to sort of compartmentalise that, process that and just move away from it without taking it on board as if it's some sort of, you know, horrible loss or something like that. Even if you were like, I kind of really needed the work right about now, it's not about that personal, um, yeah, loss. It's not, it's not you. Yeah, so you have to be emotionally resilient. Sorry, Ruby. No, that's okay. Um, I was just going to add on. I feel like that's where Mabel differs from a lot of traditional provider platforms in the sense that because you are working for yourself, rejection does 
feel a lot harsher because it's like I'm trying to run my business and I'm doing it all myself and getting rejection can be hard. But I think that's what makes Mabel really great is a lot of the workers on the platform, or at least the ones that are doing well, are very driven and caring and it's what they want to be doing because if you don't have a passion for the role, then you're not going to get job responses. Great, thank you for that. I'm going to pivot a little bit, just pulling out these these pieces of what being an independent support worker actually really means. Once again, different to being an employee of someone where they look after all of your training and your certifications, tell you to go to this course, do this thing. Very different when you're an independent support worker. Obviously, we have clients in both the disability regime and also in the aged care regime. Sometimes those certifications can be quite different in terms of mandatory, what's required for those groups. I'm just curious, um, over the last couple of years, have you? How do you feel about certifications and training? Have you invested in any training for yourself? And are there any, once again, tips and tricks that people who are listening should know about whether you know what they should actually focus on in this particular space? I will go. Oh, should I pick? You, should, you can start, David. You, you're looking raring to go. Um, oh, yeah, but the answer is no. I haven't actually taken up any of the training. I've kept looking at it, going, I really would like to, you know, invest in that, but. A lot of the time in uh, particularly the gig economy, especially if you're also trying to run a, uh, other jobs elsewhere to, to supplement, um, you feel like you're running on a bit of a wheel and you, you never really get that time to stop and, and do those sorts of things. So yeah, I'm afraid I'm the, the procrastinator that's always bookmarked all of the training pages and then never gotten back to them. So. Regrettably, <laughs> I haven't invested enough in there. Not a problem whatsoever. How about yourself, Gwen? Um, I, with a client that I have that has got MS, she lives in a house, um, and she often needs, you need two people to hoist her back into the bed, and um, they started asking me if I'm interested to get trained to do it, so yes, I've um, received training for manual handling, just hoisting her into the bed, something I thought I would never do on this planet Earth, but um, yeah, I just started doing it. It just happened organically. So I think uh, you learn on the job organically a lot of things that um, I think a lot of things feels almost like common sense. Um, yeah, like dealing with, uh, yeah, people's emotions and stuff. And like I said, there's a lot of stuff underneath. Um, but training in such, um, because my the service that I provide is mostly cooking. I'm a professional chef, so there's no training needed in that regard. Um, unlike with manual handling, got the training. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I haven't had training um, of such. I just feel lucky if I if I had you with me, Gwen, that I would have a professional chef. That sort of <laughs> sounds very awesome. <laughs> They'd be wonderful meals. And how about yourself, Ruby? I would really be interested in achieving a certification in disability or mental health. I have definitely looked into it, but it is a struggle trying to find something that fits in time-wise, that's within budget, and that's also within distance for me. I know I have looked at a lot of different courses and they're either miles and miles away. I don't particularly do very well with online learning, so I would prefer to go on campus for something like that, but finding a campus within distance of where I live and where I work has proven a bit difficult, but I'm still definitely on the hunt for some sort of certification because I would like to better myself in that aspect and be able to qualify myself a bit, work, a bit more now that I am working full time in the sector. And what do you think the certification would give you an advantage in? I think it would just definitely round out my ability to support people in the sense that I would have more clarification on what I need to do as a carer and how to go about certain situations and it would also expand my ability to take on new clients with potentially higher needs or yeah. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up very soon and let the audience ask some Q&A. So start thinking if there's anything that we haven't covered and you really want to know, you're about to get your opportunity. But before we go to that, and I'm just going to let Julia and Matt have their roving mics, um, is there any one last thing you've got, you know, 
lots of people online, lots of people in the audience here, is there one thing that you would really like everyone to know, benefiting from your experience that we haven't covered? Ruby, you've got the mic up, you go first. <laughs> I think it's important to mention that particularly with Mabel as a platform, you have no great loss from signing up if you sign up and then decide later on that it's not for you. You're not losing anything by going through the process and having a look in your area and speaking to clients. If you decide three months down the track that it might not be for you, then that's completely fine and you haven't spent a crazy amount of money or gone through a crazy amount of training. It's well within your right to just do it at home and take it at your own pace. And yeah, I mean, you guys have all made it here today <laughs> to the conference or the people watching online. So I think everyone who is attending at least definitely has care and passion for the industry. But yeah, I think that's an important thing to mention. Lovely. Gwen? Um, I'm just curious what people want to know. I don't know. I've, I think I've talked too much. No, no, definitely not. Well, I tell you what, when the audience starts asking questions, I'll throw those to you so that you... <laughs> She's like, oh no, get me off the stage. David, how about yourself? Well, I was thinking back on that, you know, setting the value of, of what you're worth. Um, and certainly there are carers out there who, who do showering and toileting and hoisting. and oh, You deserve superhero capes and masks and all the rest because that, that's way beyond anything I can do. And I think you're real heroes. But I have noticed that people who uh, take people out socially are not just helping. They're changing lives. The, the, the differences I see in clients from just that little facilitation is massive. And it, it is the difference from a person not being able to get out their front door um, to being able to engage in the world again. And it might feel like you've done so very little or something that you would happily do for a friend or something like that. But it is so significant and therefore is worth your time and the resources that, that go with that. Uh, and then your pay. Like, I think those things all match up because this is significantly important. Sometimes it gets a run in the media of, oh, you're just taking people for coffee or something. Yes, that's really important stuff. That changes lives. Oh, I'm going to so have to finish on that because I don't think any answer to any question is going to be a better stopping point than that. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm pretty sure that three of you are still hanging around, right? So feel free. I would suggest strongly, like, one of the themes of today is find some buddies, find some people who are going through similar things to you and you can go on the journey together. So you should definitely use the opportunity of the breaks to talk to people you don't know. And if you do have any questions you haven't asked yet, by all means, feel free to ask David, Gwen or Ruby at the break. But join me in giving them a big round of applause for being so awesome. Thank you, everyone. Please now join us in the conversation quarter for a short break. For our viewers online, please rejoin us at 11.15.